Hello, everyone. I'm Anumani, your modern day shaman and the author of Unmasking Your Soul, a transformational journey of truth, light, and healing. And today I have my special guest, Liz Babasola. Welcome, Liz. Thank you. It's wonderful to have you. It's great to be here. Thank you. So I'm just going to read Liz's bio before we get into mm -hmm. the interview. So Liz Babasola continually aims excuse me, to live a life of service to others by supporting them to become their best selves. With a passion for personal development and leadership development since her teenage years, Liz is an emerging expert in the areas of leadership development and young adult development. She also has a personal interest in understanding and practicing how a strengths-based approach to life can lead to one's success in marriage, parenting, and career advancement. Liz is a Gallup Certified Strengths Coach, founder and CEO of Liz Bepisola & Associates, an executive and life coaching and business consulting company established earlier this year. She's also the Assistant Vice President for Student Affairs at the College of New Jersey, where she builds college students' leadership development skills every day with the oversight of countless out-of-classroom programs. She will earn her doctoral degree in higher education leadership this May from Widener University. Congrats on that. Thank you. She's <laughs> earned a Master of Science degree in college student personnel from Miami University in 2008 with a special emphasis in young adult development theory and leadership development. Welcome, Liz. Thank you. Thank you. And I love some of those topics. So we'll get, we'll, I'd love to get more into that. The, um, really the young adult piece, which mm -hmm. is one of your specialties. And mm -hmm. I don't think I've spoken to anybody before that has been able to address that uh, on the show. Sure. Let's start by level, level setting our audience. I always like to ask this question first about what your definition of soul is and, and your experience of soul. Hmm. So my definition, I'm going to borrow from one of my favorites, Oprah Winfrey, and she says, you know, we are spiritual beings having a human experience. And when I think of the soul, that is your spiritual being, that is the divine light within you. And that divine light and that soul, that spiritual essence of you is eternal. And um, when I, you know, when I think of something that lifts my heart, I think of it right here, like the center of my chest. And I don't know if that's exactly where it lives, <laughs> but you know, you feel it when something takes your breath away or you get chills or you, you know, the, the presence when things are serendipitous, you know, that's the spiritual world, but however you may define it, whether you're religious or spiritual or not. Um, I do think that there's a greater force beyond us and when within us. And that's what I think of the soul. Um, and, you know, I've always um, been a spiritual person. It always has really resonated me that I've been blessed with many things and wonderful people in my life. And um, I just feel very called um, to give back and to serve. And all I want to do, my whole mission in life has always just a bit to help people. And I feel like that desire, that personal mission or purpose is really comes from my spirit. That's beautiful. Thank you. And, and yes, I do. The I tell people the, the portal to that place of, if you want to call it your divinity, your divine self, through which your mm -hmm. spirit expresses, is through your heart center. Mm hmm so, yeah, right, which is right here. Yeah. A lot of us feel it there. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious what you said you've been feeling that part of you for a long time. Is there a particular memory that you have when you were younger where you felt that you knew there was something more than just this human body? Um, well, I was raised in a very religious setting and my family and I'm from small town, Indiana, which is very re a religious kind of center. Um, Christianity is really where, um, it stems. So for as long as I can remember, I've, you know, prayed, you know, before meals and would pray before bed with my parents. And so prayer and, and when my grandpa passed, when I was in middle school, my first grandparent who died, you know, we talked about heaven and those types of things. So it definitely, I can't remember a time where that wasn't a piece of my life, I guess I could say. Um, 
And I feel like it was really my college years, and this is getting into the young adult development. When I went off to college, you know, the things I started questioning things, and I think that's healthy. Um, I, I was raised in a very conservative um, Christian denomination where women weren't ordained in the ministry. And um, then I went to college and I went to a church service and there was a female priest. And I'm like, that's interesting. As a female, I've never seen a female leader of a religious you know, organization. Yeah. And um, that was, you know, back in 2000. Um, but, you know, questioning a lot of different things because now it was a time for me to define what I believe for myself. And that's a very you know, you go from black and white and truth with a capital T to multiple truths, multiple ways of seeing the world, depending on your religious beliefs or assumptions you make about the world. Um, and so I, when I studied abroad in Belgium um, in 2003, when the Iraq war broke out, mm -hmm. and that was a really interesting time to be a college student, young adult, 21 years old, in a very different setting than my small town Indiana upbringing and where I went to college. And it was transformative for me, but you know, it was me deciding, do I want to go to church or not? Or do I want to, you know, talk to someone who's Muslim for the first time because I just wasn't around those different religious differences. So I think um, that study abroad experience when I was in a very different context, a very different culture, change my worldview of seeing myself as a global citizen with a responsibility as someone who's blessed. I think we're blessed to be living in America or to have an American passport in a lot of ways. And that's controversial. And even in 2003, when the Iraq war broke out, it was sometimes scary to be an American because people didn't like the U.S. at the time because right. uh, we were starting that conflict. Um, but so I, I would say my transformative years were definitely in college, which, all, which informed me to want to work with college students every day in my full time job. But it's always been a part of who I am. So it's hard to pick out a, a moment in my childhood, but more so an evolution of what that means to me today as an adult. So let's talk about uh, your journey, right? Because you always weren't the Liz that you are now. Yeah. You when we were talking before, you talked about some of your journey and, and some of what's helped you. So can you tell our audience about your journey, how you got to where you are today, and if there was a particular mask that you felt you were wearing as you were progressing through that journey, and then sure. knowing that you need to let go of that? Sure. So my journey definitely is influenced from my family upbringing again. Um, but from the sense of, of a civic purpose, like to give back to the community and to help people, again, that's like definitely been a big theme in my life. Um, I've always really cared deeply about my work, which can be uh, tricky because there's a fine line be between excellence and trying to be perfect. And I think part of my story is my journey of being a recovering perfectionist. Mm -hmm. Um, so I've always excelled, you know, very grateful to have excelled in school and worked really, really hard, not just taking things for granted and not studying for an exam, but studying really, really hard. So definitely work ethic and grit uh, played a lot of the role in my success growing up in school and, you know, getting the mental attitude award in tennis, which I think is a better award to get than MVP because, you know, tennis is such a mental sport or getting the most improved award in tennis my junior year was really proud of that. Um, but definitely, you know, we talk about, you write about mass um, of the soul and definitely trying to be perfect or pretending or trying to do impression management that I have it all together. And a lot of times it is authentic, but it's uh, something that I struggle with. Um, definitely the fine line of wanting to do my very best. And that's part of the coaching practice that I have is how to reach your full potential, but that's a moving target. Right. You're never, it's like the horizon, right? So you're swimming to where the ocean and the sky meet, but that doesn't exist, but you are striving and moving forward and you have that purpose to be in alignment, to be your best self. So it's this tension that I have even with my coaching when I talk about wanting to reach your full potential, be in alignment with your passion and your purpose together in the present moment. Um, so it's, it's really, that's been part of my story. And that's kind of what I'm passing on to people now through my coaching practice is this motto of focusing on progress, not perfection. And it's been a hard lesson 
that's been a repeated theme in my life that I now feel compelled to spread to others through coaching practice and through my everyday work with college students at my full-time job at the College of New Jersey. Um, But I think it's such an important lesson because striving for excellence is fabulous, but uh, you're always going to come up short if you're striving for perfection. And it's tough, you know, to accept failure and know that sometimes the best failures are really the stepping stones to your success. And it sounds trite, but I, I, from personal experience of failing multiple times, you know, that's just part of your journey is messing up and reflecting and learning and getting stronger as a result. Yeah. And I like, there's a, a parallel, right. In the work that I do and that, um, you are doing in the way that you're doing right of the best self and i tell people that we are like an onion right Mm -hmm. because i also talk about helping people get to their best self and it's like they're evolving and growing and doing the inner work yeah required to peel that next layer yep then there's a part of your best self that's coming forth right and then Mm -hmm you work on that next layer, you're doing more work and then you evolve. And, and I think that life is like that. Um, mm-hmm. I'm also a recovering perfectionist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we need a, an anonymous or like another support group out there. <laughs> and, and really believe that wholeheartedly that because we are spirit in a human body, that we are going to make mistakes, that we are going to disappoint ourselves and others. And that's okay. It's part of the learning process Mm -hmm. for speaking about that, because many people get tied into the um, perfectionist piece and hold themselves back from all that's possible for them. When they, they, you know, and and they may be afraid, like putting something out into the world because maybe they don't feel it's perfect yet mm-hmm. and holding back what they're meant to share because that that monkey mind, the inner, inner critic saying, well, no, you can't put this out yet. It's not ready right. yet, you know? <laughs> right. Well, and that, and that thinks that you, with that assumption that you have to be perfect and do it alone. Yeah. And that's what makes things even better is when you're in community with each other. So you, can you talk a little bit about, you know, just audience I'm sure has a lot to contribute as well. Um, so I think that's, you know, p- part of that is that the messiness is what makes it beautiful, you know? So, cause you know, when you think of a perfect painting that doesn't exist, it's just is the expression of what that artist thinks. Um, and the other thing, um, one, I have a lot of favorite authors, but one of them is Brené Brown. And I, and I think you're familiar with her work too. And she, that's where I got the idea of a recovering perfectionist from reading her book, The Gifts of Imperfection and Daring Greatly are two of my favorites. Um, She has Rising Strong as one of her newer books. But um, this idea of shame that she studied um, and with her social work background and the sense of vulnerability. And if you're a perfectionist, you are not vulnerable because you have, it's a mask, you know, because it's, it's artificial. You're not genuine. You're not true. And so that reading those books at a time when I was really struggling personally with something um, and understanding her concept of wholeheartedness, and you mentioned, we even used the word wholehearted a a minute ago, is a really beautiful way to think about, you know what, this is me. And this is, and being vulnerable to know that not everyone's going to accept that or appreciate that or resent you for that or whatever that looks like. And being okay with feedback, like in the work setting, I embrace feedback and feedback is hard to receive sometimes, but my method of doing that is because I know I'm doing my best and I know that my, where I'm trying to do my best every day and my best may look different based on the amount of sleep I got, or if I'm hungry, or if I have a toddler that's at home, that's crying her eyes out and I'm on the phone for work and you know my best isn't my best is in two places at once so your best looks different but I really think that um if you're always striving for your best feedback is great because then that just helps you get better but a lot of people don't like the vulnerability of getting feedback Mm -hmm. and because they take it as a personal attack um, as opposed to having that inner confidence of being like of course I have blind spots you know, of course I, I want to get better. 
And that's, you know, I, I, in my coaching, I talk about emotional intelligence and that's a sign that I always strive to demonstrate emotional intelligence and taking good feedback and not being afraid of feedback is I think a sign of emotional intelligence. It is. And, and how about, um, so I'm sure you must practice this as well. This is something that, that I try to teach my clients to also check in with themselves always because everyone has a different lens. Mm -hmm. So your definition of your best self may be different than someone else's. Yeah. Definition yeah. And especially when you're working for others of keeping the lens that doesn't stop you from still moving forward and evolving and growing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes words that are said to you can deflate you versus inspiring you to do better. Yes. Have you experienced that? Yeah, you're hitting on my, <laughs> you must see something inside me that, that is out there. Yeah. I mean, I've uh, heard from people talking uh, negatively about me that wasn't respectful. Mm -hmm. I've heard of rumors like that, that uh, and that hurt a lot um, because there are people that I really respected and I wish if they were concerned about something that I did that they would just tell me, you know, because um, my supervisor in my evaluation just a, a last month, she gave me an evaluation and she said, you take feedback better than anyone that I know, period. You know, like, cause I'm like, great, good, good point. Like, how could I get better? So when you hear people complaining about you at, in a work setting in particular, you know, there's those power dynamics if you're the supervisor and it may, you know, it's, it's tough. Um, and you have to, you know, have your support network and people that know the real you and uh, support you and know that no one is, you know, again, no one's perfect, obviously. And then tell the folks that if there's ever an issue, come to me. I'm great. I'm not intimidating. I may maybe appear that way sometimes because I have a lot of things on my plate. And so I look busy or something like that. But yeah, it's, it's not easy, you know, if someone doesn't see you for how you're striving to be. Yeah, and it, it must have been that we were supposed to talk about this because I've experienced that too in, in my times in, in the corporate world. Mm -hmm. And it is a tough topic. Uh, and part of what I've learned and part of why I think we're meant to talk about this is because there is a part of us that is beyond this human body, the, the spirit, the soul. Mm -hmm. and that part of you wants to give you guidance and help you in moments like that when yeah. something doesn't feel right. And I'm bringing up the whole lens thing because we all have our own experiences mm -hmm. and those experiences affect how we behave in the world, how we see the world around us and will affect how we give feedback to others Definitely. or how we receive feedback. Definitely, it's what space you're in in that moment. Yeah, and so, yeah. so it's about checking in and with your own self to see if what is being said to you feels true to you. Right. And if it does, then receiving it with grace Right. right. Knowing, mm -hmm. not taking it personally and knowing that there's an opportunity for you to grow. But in other cases, it may not feel right. And you need to trust that, too, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that people will speak what's coming through their filter and everyone has a different filter. Yeah. Uh, it's a hard one, because when you're in a boss subordinate type relationship, it makes it a little a little bit more challenging. But that's part of the growth of being able to accept that experience as well and, ex and accepting it in a good way. Yeah, and I think um, there's this other concept, a lot of times it's used in diversity and inclusion education, but it's this idea of intent versus impact. Mm -hmm. And I think that your intent, uh, understanding someone's intention, you know, because something may be communicated or, or completed in a way that wasn't what they, it, the result was not what they intended it to be. And obviously the impact needs to be addressed. Yeah. If it was offensive or hurtful or just inappropriate. But um, I think that that's a great question 
to ask someone before you share how you feel is tell me what your intention was when you said that, you know, and, and what, yeah. And because then you're, then you seek first to understand before being understood. And that's a concept from Stephen Covey, part of the seven habits of highly effective people. One of my favorites, it was one of the first leadership books I read was that it's a classic. Um, but imagine a world where we sought to understand yeah. And another thing, I just went to this great talk at a conference with um, Justice Sonia Sotomayor, mm. and she was talking about when people disagree, and obviously Supreme Court justices definitely disagree, and that's part of their job is to see things from different viewpoints, but she talked about how they respect each other so deeply, and they have lunch together, and they know each other as whole people, like that wholeheartedness concept and your whole self at work. And one thing she said that really stuck out at me when you are with someone that you don't agree with is to get to the heart of their understanding, to really understand them, is to think about and maybe ask them in a different way, but to get to the essence of what are they afraid of? And, you know, this concept of fear is on one end and then love is on the other. And you want to get to the the love side, not romantic, but just like love, like love with a capital L. And fear, you know, every we all have fears, and that's not a good feeling to have. And they must be so impassioned because they're either super excited or you believe in this so much, or they're super scared, or maybe a mix of both. And she does that with I'm trying to understand the other viewpoint with her colleagues on the Supreme Court. And I've really taken to heart that. Um, understanding of seek first to understand before being understood and a method to do that is to try to figure out well, what are they afraid of yeah. because maybe we both have the same fear and we're coming at it from different angles right. you know what I mean so I thought that was something that was really um insightful that I took away when I heard her speak the other week Thank you. yeah yeah definitely so was there a pivotal moment on your journey where you said, oh my God, I got to let go of this mask. And I, you know, there are things I need to do to transform and change or how did that happen for you? Yeah, well, I have definitely, I'm not perfect in the fact that I don't have perfect health and I have a chronic health condition that I was diagnosed with when I was in college. And I had, it was my, I was elected student body president when I was overseas in studying abroad my junior year. Um, which was a pretty cool thing to be not even on campus and be elected by your peers to be student body president. And then I came back from um, studying abroad this, that summer before my senior year and I got really sick. And I had to resign from being that leader, ultimate leadership role that I wanted. And I loved my student government experience so much. And, you know, I've, I've then got better and I was able to graduate from college. I almost had to drop out of school because, and take a medical leave, but I didn't. I stuck through thanks to the support of great support from my sorority sisters, from my parents, siblings, doctors. Um, so that was, you know, I, so I've had some rocky roads. And then in 2012, I got relapsed, got sick again. I had to miss three months of work. And that was, I had shame having to be off work, take a medical leave like FMLA type of thing. And coming back to work was really tough in or in everyone was like, great, great to have you back. Here's all this you know, stuff that you missed. Um, but I think coming to terms with like, if you don't have your health, you have nothing. Yeah. And I have this, I have a lot of mottos in life, like, but one of them is like my priorities in life. And those are love God, family and friends, take care of your health, and be the best that you can be in all that you do. And sometimes the take care of your health has to come first. So I'm a big eight hours of sleep, try to eat pretty healthy, try to exercise most days of the week, you know, pray, you know, what the holistic well being type of thing, not just your physical uh, well being, social, like have some time to relax, spend time with friends and family, that type of thing. Um, but I would say those pivotal moments of when I lost my health. Um, and then had to regain it and build back up again and having to take time off work for that. Um, and I had a really hard time postpartum when I had my daughter and I had to take an extra time off of work. And that's not fun. I wouldn't wish it on anybody and, and no one has perfect health, obviously. 
but I think coming to terms with the humility of like, you know what, I, if I don't have my health, if I, if I can't get out of bed because I'm so sick, like I can't do anything for anybody else. And I'm a disservice to the world if I, if I can't be well, you know? So I would say those were those moments in time. And that's an important topic of self-care, right? Yeah. Especially as women, we tend to be nurturers. Right. We get to fill our cup first mm -hmm. without filling your cup first and your health. Right. You can't serve others. So that's an important, I remind people that I, I, that's one of my important priorities is the whole wholeness and well-being and Mm -hmm. you know, I meditate twice a day, but I also have my, my acupuncture, she calls it my pit crew. I have my <laughs> pit crew yes. helps yes. me take care of my body. So I have an acupuncturist and I have a healer that works on me and, and I try to get a massage at least monthly. Mm. I know that, you know, all of that, the mind, the body, the spirit needs that nourishment to be able to serve as we're called to serve. So thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. That's really no, it takes a village for your own thing. Like I have an executive coach and I have a strengths coach and I'm, I try to be that for other people, but I have my own yes. and I have a therapist and I have an amazing mom who I call all the time, like a normal millennial yes. and an amazing husband and just general family, some great friends always had amazing supervisors at work. You know, it takes a village, but then you want to pay it forward you know, and you want to be that person to someone else. And that's part of what called me to want to be a coach, you know, and a consultant for teams is because I've had a lot of great coaches in my life. And so you just want to teach what you've learned yourself, you know. Can you talk a little bit more about the work you're doing with teams? Sure. Yeah. So I feel like I do this every day with college students and with my colleagues. I mean, we, um, but Last summer, I got cer officially certified by the Gallup organization to be a strengths coach. Um, so that's basically based on positive psychology. Um, and it's based on the Clifton Strengths Assessment that you take. It's about a 20 minute online assessment. Over 18 million people in the world have taken this assessment. It's called Strengths Finders, is the common name for it. And Strengths Finder 2.0, the book, has been on the bestseller list for literally 10 years running. So it's a very well-known instrument in the business world. Um, and it's based on focusing on what you naturally think, say, and do. And those are your talents, your natural way of thinking, behaving, and feeling. It's influenced in part by your environment, part biology. It's what makes Liz, Liz, Anumani, Anumani. Like it's your, your report. Your, it's one in 33.39 million likelihood that you'll meet someone with your top five report. And if you get all 34, your full report that you can pay for, you're the only person in the world who has that exact report. It's really cool. The only person. So what I got certified to do was to understand someone's results and coach them to turn their talents into strengths. Mm -hmm. So your talent is your natural way of thinking, behaving, and feeling. And when it's productively applied, it's a strength. It's something that serves you well. And when it's unproductively applied, your talent actually can be a weakness and it can be in conflict with your goals. So the coaching method is to really make behavioral changes and invest in those talents to turn them into strengths. And then something that I didn't, it, this isn't a Gallup thing, it's a Liz Bapasola thing, is to couple this idea of leading with your strengths. Um, leadership is an I love Denny Roberts' term of leadership is conviction and action. And then your strengths are your talents times investment of those talents to turn them into strengths. And then this idea from Daniel Goleman about emotional intelligence, which we've talked a little bit about, self-awareness, self-management of those emotions, social awareness, empathy, understanding other people, seeking first to understand, again, of others, and then relationship management, which is leadership, social skills. So when you combine the two together, it really makes a beautiful combination. And that's how I base my coaching is really how do we couple this idea of your talents, understanding that through the StrengthsFinder report and investing in those to turn them into strengths, understanding what your convictions are, your purpose, putting that into action, but then doing it in a really emotionally intelligent way. 
And so that's, I mean, I just started like three weeks ago, the company. So uh, I'm always interested in new clients as a shameless plug for myself, but it's because I, I just do it every day with college students, coach them, advise them in their path, um, whatever they end up wanting to do for the rest of their life. They have this moment in time in college where they're discovering who they are and what they love and value. And I supervise staff and I try to coach them, other colleagues, um, you know, so it's been really fun. Every time I have a coaching call with someone, it the half hour introductory call goes by super fast or the full hour, you know, regular coaching call. And I am a, in, filled with joy and alive. Um, and that's when you know you're doing the right thing, you know, is when joy comes from you and energy and you're in flow. Like when I write for my blog, I can write a blog post in like 15 minutes max because it's something I've been thinking about and I write very conversationally. Um, so that, that's always a good sign when you do things, I think, well, and you do it in a way that gives you joy, you know? So if you were to give some tips to our audience around something they can start doing to begin to progress towards that best self and really mm -hmm. raise, you know, that deeper part of themselves, what, what uh, would you recommend they do? Uh, I would recommend first they build their self-awareness and you always have more. It's a, it's a peeling the onion concept. As you talked about you, there's always more to discover about yourself because leadership development is first personal development. And the first step of personal development is awareness of who you are. And that's the first step in emotional intelligence. Things start with self-awareness first. What are my feelings? What are my values? What, what is, how do I see the world, you know, and um, who do I want to be? Who do I aspire to be? So building self-awareness. Now you definitely, the Clifton Strength Strengths Finder assessment, you can take it online. If you do it through me, it's um, only $10. If you can buy the book and, and get the code to take the assessment for $15 on Amazon. So however you wish, but that helps build a lot of self-awareness, but then the coaching piece comes in with investing in that self-awareness and productively um, working to take self-awareness into best self. So I would say those would be some tips. So, you know, good reflection. I think another thing is gratitude. Um, a grateful heart brings blessings, I think, you know, and I have um, this gratitude jar on my desk that I do with my students. And every day we have students that come into the office and work. And every day everyone gets a gratitude card and we write something we're grateful for and we put it in the gratitude jar. And then at the end of the semester, we're gonna read all of them together. And it can be like phone call with so-and-so or got an A on my test or, you know, I'm grateful to have a great lunch, <laughs> you know, whatever that looks like for you. But being thankful um, brings good things. And no matter what your circumstances, you're alive, you're breathing, your heart's pounding. You know, a lot of us um, have our next meal we don't have to really worry about. That's a blessing. And for people that do, you know, there's other things in life to be grateful for as well. But your needs, being grateful for your needs being met is a, is a, a basic one to be thankful for. So I would say self-awareness, gratitude, and take the Clifton Strengths report um, and read about that more and emotional intelligence, read about emotional intelligence. Wonderful. I sense that the students really enjoy that part of the gratitude. Yeah, they do. It's a ritual that we do now. So it's like, oh, I'll show you once I um this is what they look like. It just it's a little it says gratitude on it. I don't know if it's backwards, <laughs> but uh, then then you just open it up and you just, you know, write something you're grateful for on the inside and then we stick it in the jar. Um, and it's it's sweet. You know, you start the day off right, you know, so it's nice. Yes. Yeah. I also believe that. And I think Oprah was was one of the people I heard say that she kept a gratitude journal yeah. and I remembered that that being grateful for what you have now, it's kind of like a doorway for the other stuff the universe wants to bring to you. Mm -hmm. or it's like you're paying it forward, right? Mm -hmm. For what you've already mm -hmm. received. And that just keeps the energy flowing. And yeah. To you. It's um, this idea of the law of attraction as well. Like, you know, what you put out is what you receive or karma. I mean, you could apply so many different spiritual principles 
to this idea of, you know, positive thoughts, positive energy, positive, you know, gratitude is, a, is an example of a positive loving thought that that comes back to you. And it's a virtuous cycle, or you can be in a vicious cycle, you know, the other way too. So you have to be careful of what cycle you're on and getting yourself back on track if you're off, you know. Well, would you like to make a, let the audience know how they can contact you and, and yeah, sure. like to offer our audience watching? Yes. So um, my website is lizbapasola.com and I think we'll put it in the show notes. Um, and if you go to lizbapasola.com at the very top header, it says schedule appointment. So click there and you can schedule a complimentary coaching call with me, It'd be 30 minutes long. And if you have have a good experience and you want to continue the coaching uh, we are losing you one that's watching live i'll give you a, a 25 percent discount on a package yeah, okay you we were breaking up a little bit. So, Sorry about that. No, no problem. So you, you talked about uh, them scheduling an appointment. We'll put all of that underneath the video. And then Great. they want to get coaching. You're offering a, an, a discounted. Yep. Yeah, 25% off of a package of coaching sessions. Wonderful. So yeah. we'll put all that information underneath the video so people okay. can how to reach you. Thank you so much for being Thank on you. Show. It was a pleasure. Yeah, it was wonderful. Thank and you. Just reminding everybody that you are love and you are loved. Thank you for being with us. And we'll see you again soon. Okay. Take care, Liz. Thank Bye. you. Take care. Bye-bye.